Hello. This video is one of a series of lectures for the distance education course entitled Woody Landscape Plants, a component of the Prairie Horticulture Certificate Program. This video is the second lecture on the classification and naming of plants, a field commonly known as taxonomy. In this video, I will describe methods of how plants are named but also a bit about how to actually write the names of the plants. <clears throat> now there are two methods for naming plants and, and I want to talk about. One is the use of the so-called common name and the other one is the use of the scientific name which is based on, on Latin which is often uh, sh students tend to shy away from. But I hope that I will be able to show that there's advantages to using the, the Latin scientific names and that there are patterns that you can start to see that will help you learn them. <clears throat> First, the common names though. These are based on the common vernacular or language of a particular area. These are based on the language that we all know, like words like green and ash for green ash. But there are problems using the common names. One is that one plant may have several different common names depending on where it, you, you're located. Some species are, have a wide distribution, a wide range, such as from one end of the country to the other, such a country as big as Canada or even different continents. So a plant by the name of Larix laricina is known by several common names in different parts of Canada. I learned it as tamarack living in the prairie region, and if you live in Newfoundland, apparently it's known as hackmatack, and often in eastern Canada it's known as eastern larch. So you can see where confusion can come about. <clears throat> this is even more uh, distinctive example it comes from Manitoba maple, which we know very well from the prairies. Did you know that Manitoba maple is also known as box elder? And to some people, they had no idea that these are the two, the, both the same plant, Acer and Agundo. So these two common names have actually made these, these uh, a problem with communication about these plants. Another problem that occurs is that sometimes the same uh, or name is used for two different, completely different plants. Take the silver maple for example, which has is a true maple with globe leaves and has a silvery undersides to the to the leaf, and helps, hence where the name comes from. There is another plant that looks a little bit like this. It has lobe leaves, and if you flip over the leaf, it actually has a woolly white underside. But it turns out that this second plant is not a maple at all. In fact, it's a poplar and it's a totally different family and it has no relationship whatsoever. But people mistake this for and call it silver maple. And I've had many students come up to me in class in the past and say, well, I have silver maple in my yard. And then they'll bring me a sample and turns out it's white poplar, not silver maple. <coughs> also, the name itself may, the common name itself may make people think it's associated with a group that's that's not correct. For example, mountain ash is not an ash at all. It's actually part of the rose family, whereas the true ashes are part of the olive family, such as green ash and white ash. So the, this can be confusing. So I get a lot of people often saying, oh, mountain ash is an ash, and it's not. So let's take a look at scientific names. <coughs> The Latin root of the, of the family name, as well as the common family name, uh, will often depict the most common species occurring in that, in that particular family. So there's sometimes you can start to see patterns, and that's what I was saying that I'll try and show you a few tricks to this. For example, the dogwood family contains the dogwoods, and the, the, the scientific name of the family is Cornaceae, and it contains uh, Cornus species. Now that doesn't mean that it's the only species, or only genus that occurs in, the, in a particular family, but often that'll be the most common one. Same with the maple family. Uh, it's the Aceraceae, and it contains the Acer species, which are the maple species. It contains all the maples. There are many exceptions though. Take the large family such as the rose family, or the Rosaceae. It's very large. And you might think, well, it just contains roses. Well, it contains the roses, but many, many other important horticultural plants, such as our fruit crops, such as apples and plums. It contains the mountain ash I just referred to, hawthorns as another example. <coughs> 
Family names typically end in the suffix ACA or A-C-E-A-E. -E. So this is another little trick you can remember. Well, let's move now to the scientific names of individual plants because this is really where we want to get to. You'll find that uh, there are two Latin names for every uh, plant that's out there. So that's something that was developed by Carl von Linné in 1753 when he wrote a, a book called Species Plantarum where he, he developed a system of two-word naming or binomial nomenclature which gives each species a, a unique two-word name throughout the world. So that Acer Nagundo, whether it's box elder, common name, or Manitoba maple, it's Acer Nagundo no matter where you are. Prior to this system, the naming of plants was way more cumbersome and arbitrary. So that if you block it learning to, uh, two Latin names, just imagine what it would have been like to, to learn names before Linnaeus came along. In this system, it was called a polynomial system. The Latin names were added and added and added until you, the two species were distinguishable. So you had to give this long description of, you know, so you could make one, one plant different from another. To give you an example, common tomato was called Solanum cole inermi herbaceo folius panatus incisus, which means the Solanum with the smooth stem, which is herbaceous and has incised pinnate leaves. Anyway, how would you like to have to learn a name like this for every plant? So I guess we can be thankful we only have to learn two. <coughs> in the Linnaean system, then, the, the species name is in Latin, or the, the, and it's actually the species name is really composed of two names, which is the, the genus name followed by a second name called the specific epithet. And why it's called a specific epithet or why isn't it just called species, I'll just try and explain that a little bit. First, take a look at examples. Almus Americana is the scientific name for American elm. So Almus is the genus name, which is always first, and you can use the name Almus by itself. But you cannot, uh, the second name to that is Americana, which we call the specific epithet. The name Americana cannot be used by itself. It has to be always associated with the genus name. So this is something to consider. Cornus alternifolia, another one, Pagoda dogwood. The genus name then refers to a group of similar plants, such as the elms, it almost refers to all the elms. So you, you can use almost by itself, like I said, and you're referring to the elms and the almus species, you can say. But you can't say the Americana. It doesn't mean anything. The specific, specific epithet then identifies an individual species. It, it becomes a distinct group of like organisms. So there, that, that's that you get down to the, the most basic level then. <clears throat> In order to write these, the genus and the specific epithet are individually underlined or they're Alternatively, they're written in italics if you have a word processor. But I always re uh, recommend, or if not require, that you use one or the other if you're going to use these in a document. Don't mix them up. Another little trick to remember with the respect to the genus name is that it ends in either A, E, R, U, M, or U, S almost all the time. And again, the specific epithet only has a unique meaning when it's attached to the genus name. And you can use the specific epithet over and over again, but it has to, of course, be attached to the genus, and therefore it can be used again. And you'll see that occasionally where you see certain ones that are used, such as this example, Fraxinus americana, white ash, and Prunus americana, which is uh, a native plum. <coughs> there are categories below the the species names, such as the subspecies and botanical variety. Now, a botanical variety is usually a, a variety of a, an individual group of plants that has one or more characteristics different than a regular species, usually uh, kind of an isolated geographical area, for example. And, it's, and these are abbreviated as SSP period and VAR period. Now, the actual name of the uh, botanical variety, for example, is similar to the genus and specific epithet names that they are either in a lowercase italics or underlined, so they're the same. But be it known or be it uh, be, uh, forewarned that the variety name or the subspecies 
abbreviation or the variety abbreviation or other subspecies abbreviation are not in italics or underlined. So it's italics for Prunus virginiana, then the, the is not underlined <coughs> or in italics, and then Melanocarpa is in italics or underlined. Take a look at cultivars which are developed usually by the horticulturist and you know by breeding or selection. And it's just a name that's short for cultivated variety. The cultivar name is written after this, the genus and specific epithet, so it's written after the species name. And the first letter of each word, if there's more than one, is capitalized when you write these out. You put them in either single quotes or you either you can proceed the, the, the cultivar name by CV period, the abbreviation CV period, or CV without the period is acceptable in this course. But you do not underline or put them in italics. So here's an example of how they could look. Like Sambucus racemosa, you can see the italics. CV period is not <coughs> underlined or in italics, and neither is the actual cultivar name. The other alternative is golden locks in, a, in single quotes. And again, do not mix these two up in the same document. Pick a, pick a system and stick with it. I just want to say a little bit about the meaning of names, which can sometimes help you to remember them. And that is that the specific epithet often will, will be somewhat descriptive of the plant, so, such as Salix purpurea has purple twigs. Betula papyrifera has papery bark. So papyrifera name is so it refers to that. Glabra means glabrous, smooth, without hairs, and that's one way of remembering the smooth sumac. The shape of the leaf, trilobum, means three lobes, so that helps you remember that to some extent. Or even something about the actual characteristics of the sap in this particular one. Sugar maple has, or maple syrup is the sweetened aspect. Or the habitat, such as Vitis riparia, which is riverbank grape, riparia, or riparian refers to rivers, and these tend to be found along rivers or often along bodies of water. Another example is color. You see something like Potentilla yellow bird. Well, that's not too hard to imagine that it's going to have yellow flowers, and indeed it does. Or the size of the plant. For example, a dwarf plant such as Viburnum opulus nanum is a, the name nanum refers to dwarf. Or finally, um, the location of where the origin of the plant. Uh, this is one Rocky Mountain juniper that was selected from a population in, in North Dakota near a place called Medora. So it was given the name Medora. And it actually was selected from a, a botanical variety called Columnaris. You can see some examples over here where they're all very columnar, so they were it was selected from there. There's very nice uh, specimens in that area, and it's become a cultivar. So that ends the taxonomy section, and we'll move on to more about uh, how to identify plants and, and how to actually uh, build plant keys.